Hi everyone, welcome to 2.5, the final video in the theme to recaps. Again, this isn't comprehensive. Look, 2.5.1 is an absolutely huge topic. And so this is just going to kind of touch through the key terms. It's not going to go into huge levels of depth. There's so much further you could go, but it hopefully will offer a recap and give you some ideas of where you can go from here. So 2.5 is all about external influences that affect a business. We've looked at by this point in the course, theme one and theme two, We've looked at all of the four main functional areas of a business. We've looked at the marketing department. We've looked at the human resources department, finance and operations in the other sections of theme two. So this one starts looking at external factors and influences that will impact on a business. And this is a nice kind of precursor to theme three, where we start looking at all of the strategy, because a lot of the stuff that we talk about here is going to be mentioned in theme three and built upon in theme three. So we've got a few areas. We've got economic influences, which is all about the economy. Any students who do economics will find this bit fairly, fairly. Um, any students who do economics will find this fairly familiar. We've got legislation and we've got the competitive environment. Those two are comparatively small, but legislation is certainly an area where some students find quite tricky. We'll start with economic influences though. So we're going to look at a bunch of different ways to measure an economy and a bunch of different influences that factors that the economy will have an influence on businesses. So the first thing is, how do we measure an economy? Well, the main way we'd measure an economy is through looking at GDP. And GDP stands for gross domestic product. And that is effectively the total output for an economy. Again, you can go into huge amounts of depth regarding GDP. The main thing we need to know is that GDP is measured and as a percentage change. And so we usually see in the UK between 2 to 2.5% increase per year. And that is because, generally speaking, as a country, we should be increasing our output as time moves forward. We should be becoming more productive. We should be becoming more skilled. We should also potentially be growing our workforce in terms of population and therefore leading to a higher level of GDP. So when GDP is increasing, that suggests our economy is performing better than it did the previous year. That doesn't always happen. In fact, we've seen plenty of examples over the last 10, 15 years where this hasn't been happening and GDP has actually been shrinking and where we ended up in recession. We'll talk about that in a little while. We've also got a few other areas that we can use to measure an economy. We've got the business cycle, which we'll talk about. We've got inflation. We've got interest rates. We've got exchange rates. And we've got taxation and government spending. So we're going to go through all of these in a little bit of depth in this video. The first stop is going to be the business cycle. So this measures the fluctuations in GDP in an economy. And what you typically find is, and it doesn't always last the same amount of time, but we, we tend to find that it works in this pattern, this kind of this business cycle where our GDP goes down and goes up and goes down and goes up. And so there's a few little terms that you need to be aware of here. The first is the term recession. So a recession is defined by two consecutive quarters of negative economic growth. So where our GDP shrinks, it's usually measured every three months, where our GDP shrinks for two three-month periods over a six-month period, basically, in succession. We are in what we call recession. And what this suggests, basically, is that our economy is getting smaller. This is a problem for all sorts of businesses because when a recession happens, usually there's a, low, there's a lower level of consumer confidence. And this affects all sorts of businesses because when we see lower levels of consumer confidence, we see reduced spending. And if we see reduced spending, what we will also see is reduced incomes for businesses, reduced revenue. And when a business is losing revenue, one of the main things that they will do to try and you know, ensure their survival is cut costs. And the cost that's probably the easiest to cut is getting rid of staff. And this then affects consumer confidence even further because if consumers are, if, sorry, if employees are potentially losing their jobs, incomes drop within the economy and then we spend even less. And so this tends to work in a bit of a cycle. So it can be quite a damaging cycle when we have a recession. We see more unemployment. We see, we see um, much less kind of security within our economy. And this recession typically leads to a kind of trough, which is when we reach kind of the bottom of that, of that negative growth before we see the recovery. So recovery is when we see our GDP starting to rise again and hopefully our recovery will be quite long and our recession will be quite short. But typically these things tend to go in a cycle. So after our recovery, we'll reach our peak and then we'll see that cycle repeat again. And, and this can be caused by a variety of different factors and some of them aren't necessarily the fault of the government or the fault of the UK. Sometimes it can be global economic events that cause these recessions. For example, we saw in 2008-9, we saw the global credit crisis, which caused a recession in the United Kingdom. 
in 2020, we saw COVID, which caused a recession as well, because of course, when we were on lockdown, there was a lot less spending and a lot less output. So it tends to work in a bit of a in a bit of a cycle. So we go from recession to recovery to peak to recession to recovery, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's the business cycle. And obviously the blue line that you can see in the back, running through the back there, that's just our general growth rate. So over time, despite the fact that our economy goes through these these ups and downs, we should see, as mentioned above, we should see GDP generally trending upwards at around that two to two point five percent per year. Inflation is the increases in prices within an economy. And there's a few different ways we can calculate. Um, there's a few different ways we can measure inflation. We measure inflation through looking at a basket of goods. So the consumer price index and the retail price index. We're looking at a basket of goods that represent basically the things that people most likely buy. And we can compare whether those prices have gone up or down. And they usually go up and certainly in recent years, years we've seen prices go up quite significantly and so inflation will lead to increases in prices for consumers which leads to a decrease in what you know what our spending power is because if everything's become more expensive and our wages haven't gone up we potentially are a little bit poorer even if our even if our wages have gone up but haven't gone up relative to inflation um, we also see this increased costs for businesses as well and that's sometimes what causes the inflation where costs push inflation prices higher. Interest rates are the cost of borrowing and the reward for saving. So this means that for within it, for within an individual or for within a business, an interest rate is going to affect our loans. So we talked about loans when we talked about 2.1 um, external finance. When you take out a loan, the cost of borrowing that loan is that you have to repay it back with a little bit of interest. And the amount of interest you pay will depend on how you know, how likely and risk, risk-free risk you are in terms of paying it back. It might depend on how much you've borrowed, the term. It might depend on your credit rating. But it also works the other way. It also works in terms of your reward for saving. And so if you put money into a savings account or a business puts money into a savings account, they can accrue interest based around their savings. So higher interest, when we've got high interest rates, we would expect to see lower spending and more saving. By putting interest rates higher, they're basically trying to discourage spending by effectively making it more difficult for people to get finance, to get loans. And you might do this if you were trying to reduce inflation. You might do this if you were just genuinely, generally trying to kind of, yeah, I guess, reduce spending within the economy. On the other hand, we see low interest. Lower interest rates encourage borrowing, which leads to higher levels of spending but also, and also because there is a less reward for saving. You're not going to get as much if you put your money into the bank. And so interest rates will typically be quite low when the government is trying to encourage spending. So we saw interest rates reach a huge, huge low of, I think it was 0.25% when we were in 2020 because of COVID, because businesses were really struggling because people weren't out shopping and buying things. They dropped interest rates incredibly low to try and encourage people to spend and encourage businesses to be able to invest and borrow money. Exchange rates are the value of one currency in terms of another. And the key thing to remember here when we're thinking about exchange rates is this term spiced. When we are transferring our currency, we can see one of two outcomes. We can see appreciation where our currency gets stronger or we can see depreciation, which is where our currency gets weaker. If we've got a strong pound, we need to be aware of what impact this has on our imports and our exports. So we also, of course, need to know what our import and exports are. An import is when we buy something from abroad into a country. An export is when we sell something to a foreign buyer in a different country. So if we have a strong pound, imports will be cheaper. The reason for this is we can get more of the foreign currency for our pound, and therefore we will be able to potentially trade our pounds for more of the foreign currency, and therefore buying products from that other country will become cheaper for us so strong pound imports cheaper however for foreign consumers they will find that when they're exchanging their currency for ours they will get less which means that they will have to spend more of their currency to get the same amount of our currency so if we're selling something abroad for example if we're selling a car to a consumer abroad they might have to then pay more for that product so if so effectively what we're saying here is a business will want a either strong or weak exchange rate depending on whether they import or export. And obviously it's worth bearing in mind that a lot of businesses do both. A lot of businesses import a lot of materials and export a lot of products. And so they'll have to weigh up the balance as to whether they would prefer to have a stronger or weaker exchange rate. 
Typically, they'll probably prefer to have a stronger exchange rate. Spiced works really nicely, rolls off the tongue. The opposite of spiced doesn't really. We've got kind of, I guess, some people say widek or widek. Some people say wapidek. I just kind of say the opposite of spiced. But it's, it's the inverse of the previous one. Weaker pound means imports are going to be dearer because we're going to get less foreign currency for our money. But it is going to make exports cheaper because foreign consumers will be able to get more of our currency for theirs. And so again, you know, if you are a business that exports heavily, you might prefer to have a weaker pound because it means that you will find the benefit of price in other markets. In terms of taxation and, re and government spending, we just need to understand how government receives tax. There is individual tax, such as income tax or national insurance. There is business tax, such as corporation tax and VAT. Technically, VAT also counts as an individual tax because they typically businesses pass on the VAT to us, um, but it's... It, they paid ultimately there are more taxes than this but this gives you a bit of an idea and then obviously the government uses this revenue this tax revenue that's how the government makes money to fund the public services to fund schools to fund healthcare, and a variety of other different things as well so the government needs to generate money just in the same way a business does a government has a huge amount of costs and they need to generate that money somehow and tax is the way they do that so that covers the economy again hugely hugely brief um rundown of the economy but hopefully gives you a bit of an idea of what you need to be aware of in terms of key terms legislation is also fairly easy to categorize so we've got employee protection which is things like any kind of law that protects employees from poor treatment so equality any discrimination you know making sure that there's no disability discrimination age discrimination gender discrimination etc equality in terms of equal rights for people of different beliefs people of different genders etc etc and then obviously, of course, minimum wage law is probably one that will affect a lot of businesses quite heavily because changes to employee rights in terms of wages, in terms of holiday allowance, in terms of time off and things like that, all of those different legislations will have a huge impact on the costs of a business. And that's one key factor here that is worth bearing in mind. Cost is a really clear, clear running theme throughout legislation. Cost is probably the biggest negative that, that legislation has as well as other potentially difficulties in meeting legislation. So employee protection protects employees from poor treatment consumer protection does the same for consumers and so we need to be aware of what rights consumers have they have things like consumer rights in terms of the right to a refund the right to an exchange if a product is not satisfactory or to be honest if it's not opened you can just change your mind you have the right to have your data protected obviously in the modern era with the internet businesses have all sorts of data for us and they need to they need to take appropriate steps to make sure that they protect that data and it's not being you know, distributed unfairly or used for the wrong purposes. We also have the Trade Descriptions Act, which means that goods must be as they're advertised. So we saw a really famous case with Red Bull where someone sued Red Bull because they didn't get wings when they when they were drinking a bunch of Red Bull. They won the case. Um, they were able to sue Red Bull to get the money back from the product. They weren't able to get much more than that. Um, but it is the reason why the Red Bull adverts now say give you wings with a whole bunch of eyes instead because that's obviously not a real word and not a description of, you know, something that would stick out your back and make you fly. So trade, I mean, that's a bit of a silly example, but it does go to show kind of the fact that you can't have false advertisement. Goods m must do what they are advertised to do. We've got health and safety, which will affect potentially customers as well, but mainly employees and just about safety in the workplace. And so any changes to the legislation here, it's going to be an increased cost, might be potentially increased training needs for the business. So yes, of course, it makes it safer. It might increase reputation, might increase motivation from staff who feel safe and feel valued, but it is going to increase the costs for the business. We've got environmental protection. So how do we look after the, as a business, the environment? This is going to include a bunch of different factors, including waste disposal, emissions, deforestation. There's a whole range of different areas where the environment is protected. We're seeing a lot of this happen within our cities with emissions and certain restrictions being brought into place. We're seeing this with the car market, for example, with, with the move towards electronic vehicles and trying to kind of reduce emissions in, um, and you know, the way that legislation is leading to that. So, for example, the legislation says that by a certain year, I think it might be 2030, we are not going to be able to sell any petrol or diesel combustion engine cars. It's all going to be electric vehicles. So that's a legislative change that is going to change a whole range of businesses. And lastly, we've got competition law. So this ensures that competition between businesses is fair. 
such as, for example, avoiding anti-competitive practices within pricing and what have you, um, just to make sure it potentially also merges and takeovers as well. We'll talk more about that when we look at theme 3.2, just to make sure that businesses are acting with a good faith with each other and competition is fair. And speaking of competition, that takes us to the last topic, which is 2.5.3, competitive environment. It's not a huge topic. There's a few little top, there's a few little key terms you need to be aware of. One is the term monopoly. So a monopoly is a market where one business has control of the market. They have a large amount of market share. They have a large amount of power. So for example, you could look at an example of a product such as like Microsoft Windows has a huge amount of market share in the operating systems market. And so they have a fairly large amount of power there. An oligopoly is probably the one you might see more commonly. This is where the, you see a, lot, a few large firms dominate the market. So you could look at the supermarkets market. There's a range of different businesses in that market that share the market share between them we also need to be considerate of how big the market is as well and we've got big and small markets and i think sometimes when we think about business we think so much about the big big markets and that is really really important but actually some businesses will be trying to have a high market share of a smaller market some businesses might be content to just have a two or three percent market share in a really really large market if you've got a three percent market share in a market that's worth billions that can still be extremely profitable, even if it feels like compared to your competitors, you're actually quite a small business. And so that's just one thing that's worth bearing in mind when we think about the markets and competition in the competitive environment. How many competitors do you have? How big are those competitors? How many, you know, how much is that market worth as a whole? Because 1% of that or 3% of that might be still worth quite a lot of money and might be quite a lucrative business idea. So that covers 2.5 and that wraps up theme two. So hopefully you found this theme to set of revision videos useful. There are a bunch of resources in the description to have a look at, including an exam question finder, links to some of the other themed revision videos as well, and a few other resources, including Quizlet key terms. Really important to make sure you know your key terms for this one for theme two. There are a lot of quite specific key terms. If you've got any questions or any feedback, please pop them in the comments and uh, we'll see how we can we can improve as we go through or potentially offer some extra little bits or answer some questions if you've got them. Thank you very much.